Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns at the Nebraska Library Commission, um, and I have with me next to me uh, Susan Nisley is going to be our presenter for th this morning. Um, Encompass Live is the Nebraska Library Commission's weekly online event where we cover any sort of the Library Commission activities or any activities that might be of general interest to librarians in the state of Nebraska. Um, we do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. They are free and they are recorded, so if you cannot attend a live session, you can always watch the recording later. Um, we do a mixture of different things, presentations, interviews, um, webinars, um, mini training sessions, just information sessions, um, anything we think that may be of interest to librarians in the state. Um, and this morning, we have Susan, as I said, who's going to um, tell us all about WorldCare, <laughs> hopefully, uh, what it is and how you can use it. And I'm going to pass the mouse over so she can take control. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I've got a lot of information to cover, so I'll get started right away. Sorry, I might have to use the space bar. There, there we go. Um, uh, as Krista said, my name is Susan Nisley, and I'm the online services librarian here at the Library Commission. I've been here for about uh, 10 years. Um, on this slide, I just list some of the programs and activities that I um, am involved in on a regular basis at the Library Commission. So um, you may have had contact with me via one of these other programs. Um, and I just want to go ahead and get started right away talking about what is WorldCat. Um, I always talk about WorldCat as being the most popular database available via OCLC's first search service. And popular may not be the best word, but it's certainly ubiquitous in the library community. Um, it's uh, central to uh, lots of things that we do, and librarians all across the world are going to be familiar with it. Um, WorldCat is a union catalog, which means it is a catalog containing holdings information contributed by many different libraries. And uh, it contains over 174 million records describing material owned by libraries around the world. And um, what I always tell people uh, when they're trying to figure out what they can actually search WorldCat for or what they might find in WorldCat is think about all the different types of items uh, libraries own and catalog. So you've got your obvious items like books, videos, sound recordings, maps, manuscripts, musical scores, um, but you also have uh, increasingly digital items, digital objects, uh, sound recordings that are online, digital photographs. Um, you also have interesting and unique items. For instance, um, I even found a, a catalog record describing a skeleton that one of the libraries owned. So you know, wow. you never okay. know <laughs> what you're going to find um, in WorldCat. Yeah. Um, something else I tell people is that basically um, whatever it is that you regularly search WorldCat for, that's what it's going to look like it contains to you. So if you're searching for genealogical information in WorldCat, WorldCat seems like a wonderful repository of genealogical information. If you're searching for, um, you know, popular fiction, that's what you're going to find. So it really is a place where you can find almost anything. And something else to keep in mind, um, WorldCat contains uh, records describing material in over 470 languages and dialects, and also material dating back to 1000 BC, so it really um, encapsulates the bibliographic universe and beyond. Um, when do you actually search WorldCat? Um, there are several uh, reasons why you might search it. Um, you can search for it anytime you're trying to identify and locate an item that you don't own locally, either because you want to purchase an item um, you can't actually purchase it through WorldCat, but you can find information out about it. Um, you can see what other libraries collect in a particular um, area, so you can get ideas for collect development. Um, maybe you want to identify an item that you don't own because you want to refer your patrons to it. Um, maybe another library in your community or a nearby community has something that your patrons can go and access there. 
Um, it's also the place to go when you want to find items that are available to request through interlibrary loan. Um, whether you do your own interlibrary loan or whether you come through the Library Commission and, and we do interlibrary loan for you. And this is the place that we go to identify the item and locate it and so it's a good place for you to search too when you want to um, find out what you can actually request. Um, this screen just uh, captures a few more facts and statistics about WorldCat. Um, I thought it was interesting to know that um, the database contains holdings information contributed by 72,000 libraries located in 171 countries. So you really can see how international it really is. Um, so how can you access WorldCat um, here in Nebraska? Uh, WorldCat is one of 13 databases uh, that's available through Nebraska's statewide first search subscription. Uh, we subscribe to something called the first search base package, um, primarily because we want everyone to have access to WorldCat. Um, if, you, if your library has signed up for uh, Nebraska Access, then you actually have your own unique first search account assigned to your library, and you can access WorldCat that way. Um, or, and this is probably, um, in many cases, I think the preferred method, you can access WorldCat through an account that we uh, established at the Library Commission and make available through Nebraska Access. It provides streamlined access to just WorldCat. Um, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. Um, this screen just gives you some URLs uh, that you would use to access WorldCat. Um, the first uh, bullet point uh, gives you URLs you would use if you were going to go directly to First Search and log into your First Search account. And then the uh, um, second major bullet point gives you the access uh, URL for Nebraska Access. Um, the nice thing about the Nebraska Access uh, method is that you can use uh, a variety of means of getting authentication. Um, you can use IP recognition if your library has static IP addresses. Uh, you can use a Nebraska Access password that we uh, provide to libraries. Um, th that come, those are changed twice a year. Um, or, um, and this is primarily of benefit to uh, people in Nebraska who don't uh, have a library that um, they are served by, they can also get access with a Nebraska driver's license number. And I did include, we're not going to go to this link, but I did include a link um, to a page on our website that actually provides you with detailed information on all of your different linking options for providing access to the database. So we've included the HTML code that you would include on your own website if you wanted to link directly to Nebraska Access or directly to WorldCat um, or whatever. So that um, is a resource available for you. I just want to um, say for anyone watching right now, um, the PowerPoint presentation will be, um, you don't need to transcribble down all these URLs right now. Um, the PowerPoint presentation after this session will be loaded up to the commission slide share page and all of these links we'll have in our delicious account so we'll have direct links into there for you as well. Good, yeah. That, and that's why I included all these URLs on here so that you would have access to them later. Um, just a reminder, if you've forgotten a password, you can always contact us at the Library Commission and we can provide you with that information. And I don't know that this is the case for anyone today, but I wanted to include this slide um, because it, this is going up as a recording. Um, there are occasionally still libraries and schools that we stumble across that have never signed up for Nebraska Access. And so um, I did want to include the URL for the registration form. And this is free. And so it's, this is not anything you have to purchase or right. pay for anything. The state's paying for this for you. So. We just need <laughs> your information to know that you want access and then we get you set up. Um, at this point, um, I want to go ahead and go directly to WorldCat and start uh, doing some demoing for you. Um, do you think, can we uh, maybe, would this be a good time to check to see if anybody has any questions? Sure, if you want to, um, you can just open up. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and... Um, we can unmute you if you have a microphone, or you can type into the questions section if you want to. 
I need one of you. Okay. Um, I it doesn't look okay. like anybody okay. has questions, so feel free to raise your hand at any point throughout that you want to. If you do have a question, just to let us know, and we'll see that pop up, and we'll know that you want to ask. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start out um, on the Nebraska Access website. That's nebraskaaccess.ne.gov. And this is a website we put together to um, present information that we've uh, compiled that's really aimed at end users, um, your patrons. So it includes a directory of um, a subject directory of internet resources compi compiled by our reference staff. And it also provides access to the statewide databases. And that's where we're going today. So I'm going to go ahead and click on databases available to Nebraskans. And this takes you to the page that lists um, all of the databases available through Nebraska Access. I just want to point out that if you do want to access the uh, first search account that provides access to all 13 uh, first search databases, including WorldCat, you can do so down here. Um, if you want to access the streamlined WorldCat account, um, that link is up here, and that's what I usually use, and that's what I would imagine um, most people would want to use um, if they're uh, regular WorldCat searchers. And we'll go ahead and pop in. And I do want to point out, um, since it's not necessarily obvious, authentication happens at the point where you click on the database name. Um, in my case, I have IP address recognition here, so when I clicked on the WorldCat link, it automatically logged me into the database. If I was accessing it from a computer um, outside the Library Commission and that didn't have IP access, I would have been prompted to log in with either a Nebraska Access password or a Nebraska driver's license number. So that's the point at which you should expect to see authentication um, if, if um, you don't have the IP access set up. Okay, <clears throat> this is the uh, WorldCat advanced search screen. And we made this the default search screen in WorldCat. And I'll tell you a little bit about why we did that. Um, WorldCat is such a huge database that if you just do a really basic search, you're going to be overwhelmed with results. Um, and you really need to learn how to limit and refine your searches in WorldCat. Um, I think the advanced search screen um, does a pretty good job of presenting what some of your limit options are. And so we want patrons and librarians to um, come here and actually see what some of their limit options are. Um, our concern is that if people went directly to the basic search screen, they just do their search there and they'd never know what um, tools they have to improve their search. So they may be completely overwhelmed by the right. results they get. <laughs> and if we have time, I'll actually show you an example of a search, um, what uh, it would look like if, you, if it had been done from the basic search screen and then show you what more you can do from the advanced search screen. Um, I want to go ahead and start out. Um, again, there are basically two types of searches people do in WorldCat. Um, they come to WorldCat and they know exactly what they're looking for. They're searching for a known item. So, you know, you might do an author title search. Uh, or they're trying to see what's out there on a particular topic. So they've got some criteria and they're looking for material that matches that criteria. So we're going to start out with the most straightforward type of search, um, an author title search. And I'm picking an item that I know is going to be well represented in the database. So I'm typing in new moon. And then over here to the right, I can specify what type of search or which field I want to look for new moon in. So that's the title. So I'm going to scroll down here and select title. And then I'm also going to type in the author's name in this next uh, search box. So. Stephanie Meyer. I don't know if any of you guys have this problem, but I often, uh, her name isn't spelled like Stephanie usually, so yeah. uh, many times I've had problems finding, finding her. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and select author. So I've done a basic author title search that's fairly specific, and I do my search. 
And I, this is just an example that shows you, even when you're doing a specific search, in this case, I retrieved 149 different records um, describing different editions uh, of this work. Um, if you look here, you'll say um, 84 of these uh, records describe English language material. And if I wanted to at this point, if I knew I wanted English language materials, I could just click on that um, 84 right now and, and limit my search. But let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, you can see how the results are broken down by document type. The 149 results um, are, are made up of 112 records describing books, 17 records describing sound recordings, etc. Um, when you scroll through the result list, you will see an icon to the left of each record that gives you a visual clue um, as to the format. So you can see record number one describes a book, record number two describes a book, record number three describes a sound recording. And I just want to point out, um, in the case of the sound recording, if you look um, within the brief record, you'll see another icon. And it just provides you with a little more specific information about the type of sound recording. So in this case, it's a compact disc, as opposed to um, audio cassette is the other type of sound recording you see frequently. Um, record number four uh, describes the um, DVD video um, for the movie. You'll see record number five. We've got our first uh, foreign language edition. So we've got a Spanish language edition showing up. Record six. It's a book, but you can see it's a large print. So I guess what I want you to see at this point is just there are lots of great visual cues that let you know right away um, what um, each record represents. Uh, I'm just going to jump quickly to the next uh, result screen. So uh, we're going to go look at records 11 through uh, 20. And again, you know, looks fairly similar, but slightly different editions. And I just want to point out, I think this is kind of neat. Here's the. Um, Chinese language edition oh. of New Moon. <laughs> so um, you never know what yeah you never know what you're going to find when you're searching WorldCat. Um, okay, so uh, we got a lot of results. Um, I could start doing some limiting at this point by clicking on tabs and selecting some limit options here. But I just want to go ahead and show you what I would typically do um, since I'm used to searching WorldCat. I know how many results I'm going to get. So if I know off the bat that um, I'm looking for a book and, and I want English language, I'll usually just right off the bat say, I want English as my language. And here under document type, I want book. So when I uh, first do a search, I'd probably do this in most cases. And you'll see that drops me down to 54 records. Still a lot, but it's a little bit narrower and uh, more streamlined. Um, one thing I want to point out, um, and this sort of mitigates um, the fact that you get so many results, uh, the default sort order is that the records that are held by the most, li the records describing items that are held by the most libraries appear at the top of the list. Um, so that basically means that um, the records you see first are going to be describing items that are going to be the easiest to get your hands on. Um, uh, lots of libraries are going to own that particular edition. If it's something you need to interlibrary loan, your chances of being able to find one willing to lend it to you are higher. So, you know, for the most part, you're not going to have to be looking through all 54 records. The first couple will probably do it for you. Um, let's go ahead and jump in and look at the detailed record for one of these. Um, the information that's available in the detailed record varies um, from item to item, but um, you can often find, obviously, title, author. In some cases, you'll find cover art. In some cases, you'll find a summary describing what the book is about in a couple sentences. Occasionally, you will have an access URL. And um, if the item being described is actually a digital object, like um, uh, an audio book or a digital image, the URL will actually take you to that image. Um, in this particular case, the URL just takes you to a 
some uh, information about the book at the Library of Congress. So in that case, it's not particularly useful. Um, if you scroll through the record, it's typical bibliographic information about the book. Uh, and then at the very bottom, I just want to point out um, the OCLC accession number. Um, this number looks fairly innocuous, but it's actually very useful. Um, this number is a unique identifier that identifies this that, the, the, the edition of New Moon described in this particular record. Um, this is actually the number that people use uh, to make an interlibrary loan request. So whether um, you do interlibrary loan at your library or whether you come through us, um, if you or a patron has identified what they want in WorldCat, um, if they write down this OCLC accession number and provide it to their interlibrary loan librarian, they know that the librarian is going to get to the exact same item that they were looking at. So, um, so that's very useful. Uh, I know our reference uh, staff appreciate getting those OCLC numbers when library, librarians have actually looked the item up on WorldCat and identified it. It's just a double check for us to make sure we're getting you the exact item that you were interested in. Okay, um, the other link that I want to be sure uh, we take a look at within this record is the libraries worldwide that own item. You'll see this, li this item is uh, owned by 3,157 libraries. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it. And the first thing you'll notice is that um, this list consists exclusively of Nebraska libraries, and it's nowhere near um, 3,000. <laughs> um, so I just always like to give people a little bit of background information about how um, library holding libraries are displayed. Um, what OCLC uses is uh, some sort of algorithm. Um, if a lot of libraries in your state own an item, then by default, what you're going to see is just a list of the libraries in your state that um, own the item. Um, if a few libraries in your state own an item, but quite a few uh, libraries in surrounding states own it, then you'll see what's a regional display. And then in some cases, a few libraries in your state and a few libraries in surrounding states own it. Um, in that case, then you'll see a list of all the libraries worldwide that own it. Um, with it, in this particular account, we've set it up so you can override that default display, though. There's a link that says Display All Libraries, and you can always click on that, and then you'll see um, all the libraries worldwide that have indicated to OCLC they own this particular edition. So that's useful information. The other thing you might notice is that some of the library names are highlighted. Um, in those particular instances, that means that the library has gone into their um, unique first search account and they've entered a URL for their catalog. And so that allows you to actually jump to their catalog to see if they actually have the item on the shelf and if it's available. So um, there are two ways you'll typically see this done, and it really depends on the, the capabilities of the library's catalog. Um, in some cases, and I'm going to click on Grand Island here, that link will just take you to the catalog's main search page, and you can re-enter your search and then find a listing for that particular item in the catalog. This looks like it's taking a long time. It's trying. <laughs> yeah. so okay, the timed out. Um, but basically, it takes you to the opening screen of their catalog, and you can retype in Stephanie Meyer New Moon and do the search. Um, in some instances, and let's see if Carney's works, um, they can set it up so that you can jump out to their catalog, and it actually redoes the search for you. So you get to a holding screen, you get the um, call numbers, you find out whether the item is checked out or on the shelf lost, etc. So, you know, this is particularly nice if you have um, patrons who have access to multiple libraries and, you know, you want to just say run across town and you can get this there. Um, and it's also sometimes helpful when you're talking um, 
a, to a patron about an interlibrary loan, you can, you know, you can tell them, well, it looks like it's available um, and it's on the shelf in different libraries. So, you know, we're probably not going to have any trouble getting a hold of it for you. So um, that's um, all information that you can use um, to, you know, work with your patrons. Okay, um, at this point, that's sort of a run through of a basic search for a known item and hopefully gives you, anyone who maybe hasn't worked with WorldCat a lot, an overview of uh, what information is available and how to use it. So I want to go ahead and go back and do some searching now. So I'm going to go up here and click on the search tab. And I want to point out here um, this clear button. Um, in WorldCat, uh, when you've got all these limit options, it's really easy uh, to, uh, you know, accidentally leave some limit option checked. So if you're going to come back here and do a new, new search, it's good to get in the habit of clicking that clear button. So that gets rid of all of the um, selections you've made. And what I want to do now is I want to give you an example of the other type of search. Um, this is when a patron comes in and they have a vague idea of what type of book they want, um, but they don't have an author or a title. Um, and so you, you can use WorldCat to uh, help identify what they might be interested in. Um, so in this particular case, um, what we're going to be searching for is adult biographies about spies. Now, a patron's not going to come in probably and say, I'm looking for adult biographies about spies. They're probably, probably going to come in and say, um, yeah, I, I like to read books about spies. And so um, you're going to have to negotiate with them at that point to find out what exactly it is they want. And this is the um, search where I want to jump to the basic search screen for a moment and show you what would happen um, if you did a basic search um, for a broad topic like this. So I'm going to jump to the basic search screen. And you can see how limited it is. If you have an author and a title, you might be able to get pretty good results. But in this particular instance, all we know is the patron wants books about spies. Mm -hmm. So about all I can do is type in spies. And notice this is a keyword search. It's not even a subject search. Mm -hmm. So it's going to retrieve any record that has the word spies in it almost anywhere. And there's not really any useful way I can limit that. So if I did that particular search, I get over 28,000 <laughs> results. So you can see that basic search screen is really not a good option. I'm going to go ahead and jump back to my advanced search screen. And let's go ahead and redo this search. So I'm going to type spies. I'm going to go ahead and specify that I want to do a subject search for spy, spies. And I'm just going to go ahead and uh, do it at this point just to show you how much difference keyword versus subject makes. So, you know, that now we're down to 12,452 titles. Um, still a huge number, too many to really look through, but we've cut our results in half from what we were able to get to on the basic search screen. So at this point, um, you're going to want to find some ways to limit. And so you're probably going to be doing some sort of reference interview with the patron and find out, okay, well, are you interested in, you know, uh, spy novels or, or are you interested in uh, nonfiction books about spies? And maybe you find out that the patron really wants um, they really like to read about real spies, and so that gives you a lot more information. So I'd go through here and I'd say, okay, English language, that's one limiter. I know I want a book. And then you can come down to these subtype limiters, and you have an audience option, and you can specify juvenile or um, adult, which they um, list as not juvenile, so, you know. You can tell if the person wants an adult or a juvenile title. And then you also have a content limiter over here, and you've got a fiction option, 
a not fiction option, and so we could theoretically use the not fiction option. But if you look um, one down on the list, you'll see there's also a specific biography option. So, you know, if you know they want to read about individual spies as opposed to, you know, uh, a work that talks about spying throughout history, you know, you can go ahead and click on biography and redo your search. And we're down to, um, let's see, we did that. Let me go back and redo that. That's actually, I think I missed one of my limit options here. Spy subject. Oh, I know what I did. Um, when I was uh, preparing for this, I did um, stick in a year limiter. I thought, well, let's, um, there's probably lots of current material on this topic, so let's just limit it that way too. So in 1995, um, and then I left to the ending date open, so that would be through the present. And then that, that will also get anything that still has a future date. Every once in a while, you'll get the pre-pub record mm -hmm. in WorldCat, so it might have a 2011 date. Okay, so now I'm down to 680 results. And if you just look at the titles, you can tell that they pretty much are about specific spies. And so that's a pretty good way to narrow a search and um, identify items that would meet what your uh, patron was looking for. Um, one final way you can limit a search like this um, would be by library. Um, if a particular library um, is uh, a contributor to OCLC, they contribute their holdings information to OCLC, they will have a library code assigned to them. And so if you know that code, um, you could type that in and limit your search to a specific library. Um, this is something you may or may not be interested in doing. Um, I know sometimes I'll actually search WorldCat and limit it to Lincoln City Libraries. Um, mm -hmm because that's just down the street from me and I'm more comfortable searching WorldCat than my local library catalog. So if I wanted to do that, I would, I know that their code is NLN. Um, if you don't know a uh, library code, there's a little link that you can click on to find codes and it lets you search by library name. And then also one of the final pages of the uh, screens of my PowerPoint, I have a URL that takes you to a document on our website that lists the codes for Nebraska libraries that um, have their holdings represented in OCLC. So um, that, there are a couple ways you can get those codes. So this is Lincoln City Libraries, and now I've got my results down to 33. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's not that hard to go from really large result sets to manageable yeah. and very focused results in World Cup. Okay, so now I want to go ahead and show you. Um, like I said, I'll usually stick um, limiters on my searches right away. Um, and that sometimes works really well, and occasionally it does backfire. Um, but I don't, it's not necessarily a problem as long as you are flexible and you're always willing to sort of redo your search once you look at your results and analyze. So I just want to show you another example of a search that I might do, and um, it might not work out well the first time, but I'll show you how I'd revise it. So um, this is another example of going from broad to narrow, um, or anyway, I think I'm going from broad to narrow. Um, I'm looking for juvenile fiction that would be set in World War II. So if I were going to look for that type of material, I'd come down here and I'd say world, War II, that sounds like a logical um, subject heading. So I'm going to select World War II and say subject, search for that as a subject. Um, I want English language. I want books. I want juvenile. And I want fiction. So that seems like a pretty logical search. I do my search, and I get four results. Um, now this is where the more experience you have as a searcher, the better off you are. Um, 
you know, somebody who's not very experienced might think there are only four books, there are only four mm -hmm. um, fic juvenile fiction books set in World War II. Wow, you know, this is really not a very great database. <laughs> or, you know, who knew there were so few books like this? Mm -hmm. um, when you've got a little more experience, you think, okay, this, is, this can't be right. Um, this is a huge database. There are going to be lots of books that meet that search criteria. So that means um, something was wrong with my search. My search didn't work the way I thought it should. So all you need to do is go back to your search screen. And, you know, at this point I would think, okay, well, World War II maybe isn't the subject heading, but I bet the phrase World War II appears somewhere within the record, so I'm going to put my search uh, my little World War II statement in quotation marks, and I'm going to switch from a subject search to a keyword search. There we go. And I'm going to leave everything else the same, and I'm going to redo my search. So now I've gone from four records to 979, and these are looking pretty good. At this point, I'd probably you know, that search is probably going to do you fine, um, so you could probably stop at that point if you want. But um, if you're an anal retentive searcher like I am, you'd probably come down here and you'd look at the descriptor or subject heading field and you'd look and see um, the subject heading is not World War II, it's World War, comma, 1939 to 1945. And they even have one that's specific for juvenile fiction, right. too. And so I would come back here probably, um, and I type in World War 1939 to 1945. And again, this is personal preference. Um, the previous search that we did, the keyword on World War II, probably retrieved a lot of books that meet the search criteria. But I always, you know, I hate to think that there's one really great book um, yeah, that got away is. from me because my search didn't uh, cover it. So I always like to keep trying. So, And notice, when I do use the correct subject heading, um, my search results jump up again to 2,312. So this is a situation where um, I don't really think there's any other way to um, narrow or limit the search unless I wanted to limit by date or holding mm -hmm. library. I think it's probably a good search result. I went from narrow and only a few results to more results, um, but I still think that, that that's a good search in terms of giving me a good representative uh, picture of what's out there on this particular topic. Mm -hmm. um, looking at my time, we still have 15 minutes. A um, couple other um, examples. I'm going to go back to the search screen and hit clear. And I, I sort of alluded to this before, but I want to say it a little more um, directly. Um, I think it is really, really useful if you have a patron come in and ask you to find a particular type of book for them. And if they're not really clear on what they want, they can't really articulate exactly what it is they want, if you can get them to sit down next to you while you do a WorldCat search, that can be really useful because sometimes um, you can pull up a result list that has a lot of different types of items in it and they might not be able to describe in words what they want, but when they see it in a list of results, they can easily say, oh, that's not what I want, that's not what I want, that's more what I'm looking for. And then you can sort of put it into words what it is they're looking for. Um, and I think that's true even for librarians. Sometimes a patron will come and they'll ask you for something um, and th what they're asking for is really vague, but you don't know enough about the subject to even ask good questions in order to, um, you know, pin them down on what they want. Uh, sometimes if you um, do a search in WorldCat while they're there, and you look at the result list, you'll get ideas about what to ask them in order to narrow it down. So. Um, uh, one example I have is, say a patient comes in and they say, I want um, meditation CDs. And, you know, you might not know exactly what do they mean meditation CDs, but you might not really know what to ask them, and they can't really explain any more than that. You know, meditation CDs, I want meditation CDs. So, 
You can type in meditation. And again, I'm going to try that as a subject. And um, you could do the generic sound recording, which would cover um, cassettes and CDs. But if you're able to confirm with them that they really are only interested in CD format, you can come down to this format drop-down menu and say CD audio. And, you know, this is not a very specific search, but you can do it. And then um, if you look through the result list with them, you'll see um, the first thing you'll start noticing is that a lot of these records describe audiobooks. It's basically, it's a book about meditation that has been turned into an audio book. Um, you'll see here it says, um, non-music lecture speeches, compact disc. Here's another non-music compact disc. Um, so they might be able to tell you right away, oh, that's not what I want. I don't want to listen to a book about um, meditation. I want to... CD that, well, like I can listen to while I'm meditating, you know, maybe like number seven. Here mm -hmm. is one that says Circle Songs by Bobby McFerrin. It says it's music and it's a compact disc. So you can go ahead and look at that, get a little bit more of a sense of how it's described in the record. Yeah, I clicked on it twice, that's probably enough. Hmm. Well, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to jump back to the search screen, but I will tell you there is a specific um, subject heading um, music for meditation. So one option you would have would be to change your subject search to music for meditation and then CDs. Or you could also come down here and under content, you do have a choice between do you want a musical recording or do you want a non-musical recording? So a non-musical recording would be spoken word usually. And you can say I want a musical recording here. And you can redo your search. And now you should be able to tell um, from the titles that these are all music CDs. Yoga Zone Music for Meditation, Japanese Flute Music for Meditation, Earth Drums, you know. So, again, I just think this is a good example of when, um, if you look through a list of results with a patron, they might be able to tell you, no, I, that's not what I mean, that's not what I mean, that's, this is more what I'm looking for, so... Um, we've still got 10 minutes, that's good. Um, I do want to go back, and I do always like to make sure people are aware of the option to limit by language, um, because we do have population, various populations in Nebraska that speak um, their, their native language is something other than English, and so you may have people coming in saying, you know, I, I want this book, but I want, the, I want to read it in my, um, my um, native language, so... Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and do New Moon again. And Stephanie Meyer is the author. And I'm going to come down here. And this time I'm going to select Spanish, um, since that is a language that um, many of you serve people who speak Spanish. And book. And I'm going to do that search. And this brings up 10 records, so there are 10 different editions um, that are in Spanish. Um, the one thing I want to point out here um, is when you look at the lists of libraries that own them, if you're trying to find out as if a specific library owns a Spanish language edition and you don't see that library listed here in this first list, um, there are two things to keep in mind. First, um, they're not, there are many libraries in Nebraska that don't catalog with OCLC, and so their mm -hmm. holdings aren't going to be represented in the WorldCat database. That doesn't mean they don't have this particular edition of the book. It just means that you're not going to find that holdings information in WorldCat. So that's one thing to keep in mind. 
And the other thing to keep in mind is that there are multiple editions. So maybe the library you're interested in doesn't own this edition, but you have um, nine additional editions to look at. So I'm going to jump back to the list of records. And then, you know, you want to keep working your way through the list and looking to see maybe the library that you're interested in owns one of the other editions. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, one other thing that sometimes happens is somebody will be so thrilled to find out that you can actually um, interlibrary loan uh, material for them in their native language. You know, maybe the first time they came in, they had a specific author and title. Um, but then they'll say, what else is out there that you can get me in Spanish? Um, you know, I want to see a list of all the stuff you could possibly get me. Um, that is, that can be done, but it's not quite so straightforward, and so I want to show you that. So somebody wants to read, um, you know, contemporary fiction written in Spanish, adult fiction in Spanish. So let's go Spanish books, adult fiction. So that seems like pretty straightforward search, but what happens is <clears throat> it says no search terms were found. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because nothing was typed in these search boxes. There's a way around that, um, but it's not necessarily intuitive. So I just want to point it out. You can actually type your language up here. And then one of your drop-down menus, uh, one of your limit options uh, for free is you can search the language phrase field. So I'm going to search for Spanish in language phrase. That, that puts a search term up there in this area where it wants a search term. I'm going to do books, audience, um, adult, fiction, and let's just say, um, since they want contemporary stuff, let's just say, you know, 1990 to present. So when you do it in the search box, you do that instead of the language pull-down I do pull that down instead of the language pull-down menu. You don't have to do both. You don't have to do both. I'm not sure what happens if you do do both. Mm -hmm. Maybe nothing, <laughs> but... Um, so, you know, I've got 123,000 records now <laughs> that I can show. And, um, you know, here's The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros, The Da Vinci Code. Um, you know, you'll recognize many of the titles because they're contemporary fiction that has um, been popular. So, you know, uh, like I said, that's sometimes a follow-up question you'll get once someone finds out that you can get them... Uh, foreign language material. They want to know what else you can get yeah. them. And that's the easy way to do it. Um, we are about out of time, and um, so I'm going to, I think it's probably smart to stop right now <laughs> sure. and um, see if there are any questions. Um, it, does anybody have any questions right now? I know I covered a lot. Um, but we have about five more minutes, so. Um, looks like Michelle says she has a question. Um, you can unmute her. We'll see if she has a microphone. Um, Michelle, if you have a microphone, you can go ahead and talk into your microphone. If not, you can just type your question into the I'm question. Muted. Um, yep, we hear you. Um, yep, we hear you. Okay. We heard somebody. Michelle, we have you unmuted if you want to go ahead. I'm going to hand the mouse over to Krista so she can. We're not hearing for some reason. Oh, okay. All right, Michelle, you don't have a microphone? That's fine. Go ahead and type your question into the questions box. Maybe we'll see it there. Um, We do have a question that was here previously. We can go back to and do that while you're, you go ahead and type while you are, Michelle, um, that Susie Dunn had. When is it a good idea to use the title or subject phrase a phrase option? Ah. Um, so the question was when to use the title phrase or the subject phrase. And I know I've had good examples of this in the past, but let me see if I can think of some off the top of my head. 
Um, the, t the title phrase index is basically an exact title search. So that means that if you have any little part of the title wrong and you're doing a title phrase search, you won't find um, your results. Exactly. So you have to be very precise. Um, when it works is if you're doing a title search and you're getting lots of extraneous results because lots of other books have the same title, the same words in the title as um, what you have in your title. So let me just go ahead and do a. Uh, Um, um, let me just try this. Margaret Atwood has a book out called Year of the Flood. Let me just see what happens when I do a title search for that. In this particular case, I do get her book right away, but you'll see there are lots of other titles that also um, contain somewhere within these records. They probably have some, you know, title fields that have Year of the Flood in them. If I were to go back and redo this search as a title phrase search, as long as I have my title correct, it will just bring up um, books that have that exact title. You see, it's hers and another book with the same title, different author. So it's number three there. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's the exact. Oh, yeah. another. Uh, so you have to look beyond that. Yeah. Make sure you're getting the right yeah. one, too. That books, people have shared a title. <laughs> yes, people can use the same title. Um, so that's an example um, of where it can make a difference, um, especially if whatever book you're looking for doesn't show up right away and you've got a long list. And the other thing you can sometimes do instead of doing a title phrase search is you can come over here and click on this. This is a browse button. And it lets you browse the title phrase index. And so that's an alphabetical index of all the titles in the um, database. And so you can see here, you know, Year of the Flame, Year of the what, Flame Bird, Year of the Fling, Year of the Flood. Um, so, you know, that's another way sometimes to search. Sometimes you'll have the beginning of the title correct, but there'll be something wrong towards the end of it. Maybe a patron gave you slightly, you know, maybe they gave you a slightly incorrect title. It has even the wrong preposition in it. Um, if, you, if you go in here and browse and look for um, alphabetically, you'll often spot it. Um, the same thing goes for subject headings. Um, if I type in something like, um, let's do my world war search again. Um, if I just do a plain old subject search, it will find, it will retrieve records um, that have uh, you know, more specific subject headings. This is a portion of the uh, subject heading, but they may have um, you know, and so the one that had juvenile so yeah. on the end of it also yeah. to narrow it even more. Right. Yeah. So if I just do World War II, 1939 to 1945, I get, what, 427,000 results? If I, I believe if I do the subject phrase, it's just going to retrieve records that have that as a, the exact subject heading. So well, it did, re it did reduce it a little bit. So, you know, that's, again, that's something that you can play around with. Um, but when you use the phrase index, you have to be, you have to exactly match what is um, being used or what's in the index. So it, it can be very useful, but you got to be careful. you got to be careful. <laughs> um, I'm going to, let's see if we had that other question. Ah, 
hers was the same thing. She had a question about title phrase. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. <laughs> and I think we had an echo because maybe we mm. unmuted somebody. We maybe yeah. unmuted people for questions, and we were getting some feedback. So, Any other questions anybody has? Um, You can raise your hand if you have a question, or you can just type right into the questions box. We have that open so we can see um, if you do have any. Mm, there's nothing right now. Okay, well, okay. if we don't have any questions, did you have anything else in that PowerPoint that you wanted to show? Um... You said there was I some think, other slides. Let's just see what we've got. Um, this, that's just my contact information. If you ever do have questions about um, WorldCat, feel free to give me a call. Um, sometimes we have patrons or uh, librarians call us. There's some search that's just not working. You know what you're looking for should be in there. And sometimes it'll take a couple of us to, you know, figure out what's going on. But, you know, we're always willing to, you know, co-search with you. Um, I just want you to be aware that I've got some URLs for additional sources of information. Um, there's a handout that I use uh, when we do WorldCat training during the Database Roadshow. Um, we've got some WorldCat practice questions and answers. Here's the URL for the document that lists the um, three-letter codes for Nebraska libraries if you ever want to limit a WorldCat search to Nebraska libraries. And finally, there is a document that OCLC put together on using WorldCat for genealogy. So that's something that might be of interest also. Mm -hmm. um, finally, um, I just wanted to leave you with uh, some of the upcoming sessions that are coming um, in future weeks. We actually have one for next week that wasn't on the oh, yeah. just yet. So <laughs> you can see here this next one that she has is the April 21st Tech Talk, um, which is two weeks from now. Um, but we do have one scheduled for next week that Hopefully, Jeanette is in the process of getting up on the calendar. We just finalized it yesterday. Um, so actually, next week's on April 14th will be um, some librarians who have attended PLA use, um, um, with grants they received from the Library Commission for the funding to get them there. So we have some librarians from the City Libraries and a librarian from John Stahl Library at West Point that will be coming and talking about um, their experiences at attending PLA this year, which was in Portland. I forget where it was. <laughs> Um, so that will actually be the one, um, and it should be up in the calendar today if it's not there okay. already um, for April 14th. And then this is our next three after that that we have coming up. Okay, great. Thanks for, so, thanks for coming today. Thank you very much. And um, we will actually hold that. So it's going to be right there. Yeah. I'm going to do that up there. Yeah. And um, this has been recorded, so we will have it out to you also to listen to this if you want to, and hopefully you'll join us next week and the weeks after this for future ones. Thank you very much, Susan, and thanks, everybody, for attending. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.